Welcome to the uh, second podcast from the Forces Transition Group and sponsored by Force 4. Um, this is um, the second podcast on who am I? Trying to understand who you are in your transition or your resettlement period, whatever you want to call that. Now, this one's all about identity. Now, I'm touching on identity, which is quite a vast subject because of the recent events um, about perhaps um, people are feeling around the um, around the world if they've served in, in Afghanistan and, and don't really know where they where they fit right now and they're having strange feelings. But of course, I'm also looking at the series of events that went on over the last two months and when several of my close friends and friends of of, of the group here have man- have taken their own lives, which. For me, it has many reasons, but identity is part of that. Now, we've got some fantastic people on here today. I'm not going to, uh, I would do them an injustice if I introduced them, so I will let each person introduce themselves. Um, Martin? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, so I'm Martin Smith, um, the uh, the founder and MD here at Force4 uh, Leadership and Management Training. Um, we're a, a CMI uh, accredited training centre. Uh, and, and for our part with uh, Force Transition Group, we talk to an awful lot of forces leavers on a, on a daily basis, uh, just helping them identify what they've got, uh, and where they want to get to, and how we can help them do that in terms of uh, just age of general guidance and be helping them with their CMI calls. Thanks very much, Martin. Simon? Hello, uh, yeah, so I'm Simon Parsons. I'm an aircraft engineer by trade, um, just currently serving in the military. I'm a 24 year point, but my passion is very much as a human performance coach, an NLP practitioner, and a well being trainer. Thanks very much. Uh, Adrian? Hi, everybody. Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Adrian Fadzilla. Um, I am a veteran. I left in 2012. Um, and since that time, I've done a number of different jobs. Um, and during that time, I had some very low points, and I'm now at. Uh, I wouldn't uh, on, a, on a better than place than I used to be, um, um, but yeah, hopefully I'll tell you my story today of what happened to me, and maybe it will help you. Thanks, Adrian. Morris. Hi, uh, I'm Morris Epworth. I'm married to Megan. I've got uh, six children, nine grandchildren, ex-professional footballer for ten years with Sunderland down in South Africa with Arcadia Shepherds during um, Mandela's time of transition. Uh, I've been in retail for 30 years and the last 10 years I set up MH Coaching and Leadership which is a leadership company based on um, working out who you are and I work with education, I work with footballers, I work in retail and one-to-one. Thanks very much Morris. It's also interesting to know that Morris is actually working um, alongside me in some kind of um, small partnership in which we are actively helping um, service leavers, veterans, reservists, um, currently in um, uh, all different kind of problems that they're going through. And that has all been funded by um, money raised from some of the the, 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 the guys who unfortunately took their lives over the last few months. So thanks very much for that, Morris. Perhaps we'll talk about that a bit later on. Yeah, total privilege, John. But we hear about identity. Now, it'd be wrong of me to go on about how I feel about identity um, or to just say in my words. Um, so I think it's very important to try and understand why we have this identity problem. What actually is identity? And because we've got Simon here, Simon here, we've got an expert in it. So Simon, could you just explain um, in, a, in, a, in a short period what, do you, what, what identity is? Uh, yeah, of course, John. So... Before I go into identity, I'm going to strip it right back and go right back to the start. So as a five to seven year old, we we very much build our deep rooted values. And, and a lot of those values are learned values from our parents and the way we've been brought up. Um, and we carry those through into our adult life subconsciously in some cases. And well, then we get to this point us military types where we join the army and there's a bit of a shift there's a shift in our values and beliefs and 
for most people watching this, they'll appreciate that you go through basic training, they knock you down, and then they build you back up. And that's very deliberate. That's to knock the civvy out of you and build you up into the best possible soldier that they can or officer. And you've almost got these values and beliefs pressed on you. And it's within military doctrine. We've got the army leadership code. We've got our values and standards. And it's part of the fiber of who we are as military people. So there's, there's the first change. And then as you go through your career, the longer you're in, the more institutionalized we become. And we get to this point where we have this military identity. And perhaps for most, that military identity is all we, all we know when we get to that resettlement stage in our career. And I want to talk, give you a, a useful little analogy and it starts with an ant. Now, the ant represents the logical part of your brain, your conscious part of your brain. And you may think that it's a good idea to go into the oil and gas industry, for example, because you, you know people that have done it. You may earn quite a bit of money and you don't know a great deal else. So you start going in that direction. The issue being... The ant is on top of an elephant and the elephant is walking in a different direction. Now, the elephant represents your subconscious, your true identity, your values and your beliefs. And if you are going in the direction of the ant, it doesn't how much it doesn't matter how much effort you put into that. You're going in the wrong direction. And the reason for that is it's not congruent with truly who you are. So let's go back to the oil and gas um, example if you're a family man if you have a wife and two kids and they are relying on you and they want you to be there for them because you've been away for the last 20 years with the military then it's probably not a good idea to follow your friends and go into the oil and gas industry because it's not congruent with your situation uh, and another term for that is an ecology check you need to check with the environment around you the people that matter most to you and your priorities whether the decision you're making are congruent with that situation. Now, when we leave the military, we have a lot of identity stripped from us, whether we like it or not. We have our uniform taken off our backs. We have our rank taken off our chest. In some cases, if you're in a married quarter, you have your house taken away. So when you get to that point when you're leaving, a lot of the, what you think is your identity has been taken away. And unless you know what your true identity is, the deep rooted values and beliefs of who you are and what you are, then that can create an element of fear. It can create an element of loss and potentially in a whole load of overwhelm because you're in a situation that you don't know how to deal with. Simon, I mean, are we, are we, am I right in thinking that social and cultural systems actually define our identity and and um, obviously in the forces, you've, you're uh, enforced to live one social and cultural uh, system. Uh, and then, as I think on the last podcast, um, I think it was Adam that said, John, wasn't it, that it's almost like a shock of release rather than a shock of capture. It's a shock of release because, you know, all of your uh, social and cultural systems have just been stripped away uh, and now you've not, not got any point of reference. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The, um, we, we, we spoke about the identity being your true identity, but also the way you interact around the environment around you. And that, that could be the military environment, that could be the workplace, it could be the systems that are in place in the military, the SOPs, the, the routines that you are used to following. Once that has gone, then as you quite rightly say, you've lost that point of reference and, and that can mm. induce an element of fear, an element mm. of loss, because you haven't got those, those psychological safety systems in place that you're used to. And you need to now find, find your own way by, by virtue of that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the issues, and this will be relevant to many people out there right now, and many who've probably been through it, is four years later after I've got out, I still sometimes don't really understand what I'm doing, what my actual job is, why I've been placed here. 
but what the next step is. Am I doing things right? Am I doing things wrong? I, I still don't quite get it. So what you're saying there actually falls right into that, and, I, and it gives it, it gives me a little a little bit of clarification on why I might feel like this, because it's simply very confusing. And certainly a lot of things you're saying there um, will uh, will be relevant to, to, I believe, everybody who leaves a military. I think that every single person will go through that at some stage and at different levels, which kind of, um, and thanks very much for that, Simon, and we'll, we'll do a bit more on that as, as we finish, but brings me on to um, where we want to go with this. Now, I believe because of identity issues, and the, of course there are a lot of other things that can come along with identity and problems that people may have had, but some of it, and some of the some people um, do um, have way uh, larger problems and go way further along the line and perhaps do uh, take their lives. And I think it's really important that we don't skirt around this subject and we use real examples to let people know that this is normal. This happens to people and how you deal with it and um, how you get that help and as quick as you deal with that and get that help is really important. And we shouldn't shy away from that because there's lots of things that come with that. I don't like the feeling of how I feel. I feel embarrassed. I don't want to talk about it, but we must start doing that kind of thing. Now, the first step along this road, and first of all, why we've got Adrian here, is for, to tell his story. And he shows absolute courage in doing this. Um, I've heard this story uh, two times before. It's absolutely um, heartbreaking. And also could have been where I, or could, could, could be where I, the road I perhaps would have gone down. Because I have a lot of the feelings that Adrian talks about. Now, we'll take this story so far and then we'll stop and then go over to Morris and I'll explain why um, after that. But Adrian, thanks so much for coming on today. Um, I, you know, I, I understand this, this is going to be hard, but please, um, I'll, I'll leave the floor with you. OK, thanks, John. Um, just before I do start, I just want to follow up what Simon's talking about there. About Do you think that we get out trying to keep an element of that identity such as i got out as a wo2 so i'm out there looking for roles and jobs and um, because i got out as a wo2 and let's say you know i wanted to john knew me when i got well we knew each other but we kept in contact but i wanted to prove to john that i was a wo2 and i've not got out and got a job putting gherkins in the burger at McDonald's because he saw me as a W02. So do you think I've tried to keep that sort of identity of to tell everybody I got out as a W02 or someone got out as a major? So we need to look for those roles in the civilian street as opposed to going for roles that are lower because that's what we think people are going to look at us and, and judge us by. Um, that, that is an interesting point. I'm 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 currently in resettlement now. Uh, so I, d I literally don't know what it's like once you've gone beyond that point and you've left. But what I will say is you're, you're kind of going back to this point of reference. You're using that WO2 as a point of reference and you're trying to find where you fit in the civilian world. That's certainly what I'm going through right now. Where do I fit in that civilian world? Um, but it could be something else. It could be looking within the fact that your value may be to be um, driven and succeed and achieve because that's the way we're trained in the military and you might want to be a success it could be as deep as that that you want to be a success and stacking shelves or pickling gherkins to you as an individual isn't isn't that of success so it's what does success look like and that's why I talk about the ecology check if the success is a work-life balance then you don't want to be going off getting a 60 grand job and being thrashed and not seeing your family for it because that may be success in terms of financial but it's not success in terms of where your values sit i i i i, I understand you adrian i chased the title i call it yeah i thought 
everybody was watching me as I left, thinking, let's see what he does. Let's see what he, what, what he gets. He's, he's an XRSM, all that kind of stuff. The honest truth is, no one cares. The only people who really care about you are in that house with you and your surrounding family. Everybody on the outside has got far too much going on with their own lives, probably acting the same way as you are hmm. and looking after themselves. So if I can give anyone an advice, look after you and your family and, and do something that you really want to do and get yourself in that place because no one's watching you. No one at all is watching you, believe me. Yeah. I've got <clears throat> just something to add to that. Obviously, we, we, we you know, I sit here in, in Civvy Street talking to an awful lot of resettlers. And one of the major points of confusion is, you know, if you're a, a, a sergeant or a WO2 or an RSM, what does that buy you in Civvy Street as a level? Am I, am I a director? Am I a senior manager? Am I a middle manager? Am I a lower manager? There is no point of reference. Um, it would be lovely if there, if there was. And certainly employers out there in Civvy Street, in any industry, don't necessarily you know, identify a military position with the jobs they've got to offer. Uh, and that's certainly, um, uh, whether that's a, you know, a, a misnomer or, a, or a, a misperception, it's certainly one of the things we talk to with, with transitioners is let's, let's forget that. There is no point of reference. Let's look at you, what your experience says and what your qualifications do to back up that experience that's what you know that's what they'll look at um yeah. and, then, and then they'll look at them the person the human being uh, when you're in front of them that's a good point yeah happy with that Aaron? yeah um okay so about me then um so i served for 24 years um that was 22 years and then two years of veng first line engagement um in the royal signals um, my last post was as a WO2 RQMS into Signal Regiment in York, which is where I served with, with John. So I followed the Top Force Transition Group for a while because I was quite impressed with what John was trying to do by helping uh, those getting out and those who've already got out. Because I don't believe I got that advice that he is offering when, when I was getting out in 2012. Um, so my last year uh we got back from afghanistan in about march 2011 and i got out in april 2012 and during that last year i didn't really commit myself to any resettlement because i didn't know what i wanted to do um during that time i was given the job as a casualty visiting officer for a young 19 year old from the, the rifles who was seriously injured so i would say from getting back from afghanistan in the march probably until about the september of the same year I concentrated on that um, and it was during that time I I went because I was on first time engagement I went to the CEO and I said I want to get out now I've had enough and you know six months later I was out so I didn't concentrate on what I wanted to do I just wanted to get out I wasn't happy with being serv serving anymore um, I attended the career transition workshop um, it was a three-day course, but I did one because I didn't think that what they were doing on offering was was that good. Um, um, so I just took it up on myself to do my own CV. Um, I attended a uh, my LCAS course, which was a security consultants course, because at the time security was big. And there was Iraq and Afghanistan work going on. So I thought that's the route to go because that earns the most money, at, like so Simon mentioned earlier on, you know, we, we kind of want to go where the, where the money might go. So, and we think that's where we get the best route to take. Um, I wasn't made aware of the negative things that could happen when you get out. Um, and I wasn't made aware of the support that was out there either. Um, maybe it was my naivety thinking that everything was going to be um, rosy when you get out. You know, you've not got a uniform on your back, but actually it had the complete opposite effect of uh, um, the, the, what would suddenly follow. So my first week out, I got out on the Tuesday and I was told, well, you know, you're not got a job yet. So 
go to the job center and and sign on because that's your right you get your benefits you know just get just it's, it's what they say it's money for old rover really um so i went to the job center um i sat in the queue with a load of other civilian people there and i'm, I'm not going to judge them of you know what they were dressed like I, I was there in my suit and my tie you know and you know looking all ex-military um and i sat down at a desk and they told me okay what do you want to do and i said i want to go into security they just said will you do day work will you do night work i said yeah um they didn't even bother looking at my cv uh, and i said well look at my cv i was there i wasn't officer class two well to, to them that made no sense at all what well, a class two and you know i could be i could mean anybody um so they gave me the books to fill in and said you need to come in every couple of weeks to do to say you've applied for jobs and this is your book here for signing on and getting your money um and i i left the job center i got in my car and i just cried my eyes out in the car because four days three days before that i was in two signal regiment wo2 rqms everywhere i walked people would brace up with the, the, the ranks that were lowering me of course brace up and say sir now i'm not saying that i get off on that but i went from having that identity of a wo2 and having a, a, a sense of belonging to somewhere to sitting in my car crying at the age of 40 um with no identity and no sense of belonging um I, I sat there and cried. Um, I called a friend. He asked me what I was going through. And he just said, well, take everything back in there then. Don't do it. Just do your own thing. So I did. I went back in the job center just 40 minutes later, gave them all the books back and said, I don't need your help. I'm going to go my own way. My, my gratuity had been paid into my bank account. So I thought I'm going to live off that for now. Um, and then I started looking for a job which maybe I should have done weeks, months before, but, you know, I thought I'd take a break. I took a job in Afghanistan, which probably wasn't the best idea because when I left, I'd said to my fiance at the time, uh, when I leave, I'm going to be at home more. And exactly, this is exactly what Simon has just mentioned. And I took a job in Afghanistan, which was on pop star wages. I was on I mean, 700 pound a day um and it was going out there working for the ministry of defense out of camp bastion so i kind of yeah i went from military back into military again somewhere i was really comfortable um but i i went there just after i got married so i got married in 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 the june and in the july four weeks later i was out in afghanistan again thinking that's what i needed to do because that's where the money was and at that time, money to me was everything. You know, I was getting out as a WO2 wage, which was a pretty good wage. And I needed a good wage to, to live off, to keep my family um, going while I was away. And I was doing 12 weeks on, two weeks off. And I did that for a year. And it, 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 towards the end of the first year, I realized that money really, really wasn't everything in life. Uh, and I had to change my perception. And that's when I came back to the UK. And that's where things started to get really bad. Um, I was struggling to get a job in the UK, mainly because they said I had no experience in corporate security, which is what I was trying to do in London. Um, although I had qualifications and I was working towards my master's in security, a lot of companies I was going to were just not entertaining me because they were saying you've got no experience in what you want you to come into. Um, so I eventually got an interview with a company in London and they weren't going to give me the job. Uh, but I said, look, what have you got to lose? You know, take me on and, and see what you get. Um, and if I don't perform, then, you know, just get rid of me. I said, but, but give me a chance. I need a chance. And, and they gave me a chance. Um, it wasn't on the best of wages. I was living in the Union Jack Club all week. I was paying for um, my accommodation, paying for my travel, paying for my food. Um, and 
I think the what the, the initial wage was about twenty eight thousand a year. I think after I was after I'd paid everything out, I was only on fifteen thousand a year, and I started to get into debt to debt. And what I was doing, I was. I was lying to friends about how well I was doing. I wanted them to see me as, wow, he's doing really well working in London. So I was saying, I'm working in London and I'm on 50, 60,000 pound a year. So they would think, wow, he's done, he's done really well for himself. But it wasn't, I was, it was the complete opposite. I was, I was, I was on a very slippery slope down hill. Um, and that is when depression started to set in because of the debt and because it was affecting my marriage. Um, started to feel very weak and very vulnerable. And I was again ashamed of myself and of what I had become. I was, I was lying to friends and I wasn't being true to them and I wasn't being true to myself and I wasn't being true to my wife. Um, because Look, I was I was a W O two, and that's in her mind. In her mind, that is what I was. I left as as a strong W O two for all those twenty two years I served. There was not one stage where I felt like this. So, why was I feeling depressed now? Um, and things started to just get worse for me uh, and, I, and, I, and I didn't want to burden everybody so I suicidal thoughts started to cross my mind and it wasn't just an off-the-cuff sort of thing I was planning it I, I, I put in place a plan of how I wanted to do it I thought about what was if I did it and it failed. Um, what would happen then? Um, you know, my family would need to look after me, uh, and I I took myself to a bridge across the M1, uh, and I sat in my car for ages, just watching the trucks and the traffic go by under the bridge. And that is the time where I thought to save all this bother is just, I wanted to jump off the bridge. And the only thing that stopped me was the thought of my children and uh, knowing in the future um, what their dad did. And, that, and that's what stopped me jumping off the bridge. But I called a friend of mine at the time and I spoke to him and I told him and he was um, annoyed that fact that I hadn't spoken to him. He wasn't annoyed at the fact that this is what I wanted to do and he wasn't angry with me. He was just annoyed that I hadn't spoken to him before about these, what I was going through and, and how he could have helped. Um, so you know, he dropped everything and he, he, he came to me, you know, to to see me and if anything, just to give that that brotherly hug, I guess, we all sometimes need, um, and just to help me and get my mind back on track again. I called the Samaritans, um, they put me onto combat stress, and combat stress dealt with me for for quite some time. Uh, and the NHS did as well. And it turned out that I was also suffering from PTSD. Now, I'm almost ashamed to say I've got PTSD because my PTSD wasn't from Iraq or Afghanistan. I know there's guys and girls out there who've seen some horrendous things. My PTSD, it appears, stemmed from my childhood and my very early years in the forces. Um, so... None of it is related to Iraq and Afghanistan. So even now, to say I was diagnosed with PTSD sometimes makes me feel a bit almost as if I'm not worthy to have PTSD because I haven't seen some of the things that a lot of young soldiers 
uh, seen in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, I was in the role signals, so we didn't really do the frontline sort of stuff. Um, so I got diagnosed with PTSD. Um, that's now been dealt with. I am on uh, antidepressants. Um, I've been to some very low places. Uh, and I've broken down in floods of tears in front of my bosses, you know, even recently, yeah, just because things get on top of me now and again. You want me to stop at some point, didn't you, John? Yeah, let's let's stop there. Um, absolutely, you know, courageous thing you're doing here, Adrian. Um, what I what I would want to ask you is. Um, yes, we're going to go further with this and, and see how you've come out of it. But do you think if you'd have gone to somebody earlier or had the opportunity or understood that you needed to because it was something you believed was normal, would all of this where you got to the bridge never have happened? I think so, yeah. I think we are... I'm not saying nobody feels like this. I mean, I was ashamed at how I was feeling. And that's made me scared of talking to people. You know, even if, you know, even if we, had, me and you had kept in contact every single day from the moment I got out in 2012, I would have been ashamed to tell you about this. Um, and, I, and I think that's what, what stopped it. And if I, and this is this this big thing now of talking to people of uh, you know so much on tv now and stuff i think that talking to people is what people need to do and that's what i didn't do and that's what got me to the stage where i was at so and it was only that last bit of talking as i was in that location on that bridge that stopped it if i'd done it before not been so ashamed to feel that way um then most definitely it probably wouldn't have got that way so talking is such a big thing now and even if it was just an insight it could have been just a 30 minute speech on it it doesn't have to be big but it puts it puts something in your head then that when it does happen it triggers a switch you know go god they mentioned that on that 30 minute briefing that we were talking about um and it, it maybe prepare you for it and then make you realize okay i've got to go down this path now or, or that path uh, for me, it was just one straight path. I had one road to go down when I got out. There was not 10 different routes I could go down for my issues. It was one route, and that was the route I was going to go down. So if somebody or a um, an element of the MOD had 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 prepared me, look, they prepare us for everything. You know, they prepare us for every single thing that's going to happen in your military life. Um well, for most things, you, know, you go on operations and you touch on every little single thing that may or may not happen. Yet, when it comes to getting out, they don't touch on it that much. And they certainly don't touch on the, that mental side. Uh, maybe they do now. I don't know. Um, but if they could prepare us just a little bit more, then I'm sure that would help me. Yeah. There's definitely work going on. The, the armed forces have, have realised um, without being in the forces, I wouldn't know at what level and, and how far that's gone, Adrian. Um, but I do know people who are actually working at the minute and they, they are doing a lot of work with it. Whether it's so much to do with the end piece, um, I'm not convinced because I'm still dealing with lots of people going through lots of things um, in all different, um, at all different levels. Um, we'll go over to my great friend Morris next. Now, there's lots of connections here, actually. Um, Morris is, as he said, an ex-professional footballer. And, and I've listened and I know a lot of things that are going on within sport right now in which they have exactly the same problems as us military folk. They generally have a good career, in some cases quite a long career, but then they get to middle age and they leave. So there's a lot of similarities, although we're not quite here to, to talk about that today. Morris definitely understands what we're going through because he's been through a lot of that himself. But that's not what I brought Morris on today to talk about. I feel that we need to go one step further. And what Adrian spoke about is getting to the bridge. 
Now, that was going one of two ways. It could have gone where he went over the bridge. Luckily, and, and thank God, it went the other way in which he's now recovering. And there's lots of help there. And, and Adrian's moving on with his life, which is amazing. But what we're going to talk about now is what it's like for the family, for people around that family, of when somebody does take the life. In the hope that people start to think, just like Adrian was saying, I didn't do it because of what my children would think. And if we can place that into people's memories, into people's brains, and to, to start to get them to think like that as well, perhaps less will do that. Now, I'm not going to um, uh, claim to understand how Morris feels, how Adrian feels to his level, um, but I will let Morris tell you it from the heart. Morris, thanks so much for being here um, and for about what you're going to talk about. Um, you've helped me immensely in my in my um, last four years as I've been leaving, but I'll leave the floor to you, Morris. Yeah, um, where I'm, I'm going to start, obviously, where everybody else starts at the beginning, but um, I just want to tell you that, you know, I don't do, I don't do theory. In my business, in my life, I do reality. And you can learn all you want from books, which I haven't got a problem with that. But, you know, reality is what it's all about, to be honest. And I'm going to tell you the story uh, uh, about something which is very real, something that is incredibly raw, but I want people to know what would happen if Adrian you had jumped off that bridge because I know. So I'll give you a bit of background. Mark was my son-in-law. He was 27, 37 years old. We had four children. And um, he was a massive bodybuilder. He was a quality guy. No ways and graces. He was a he was a doorman in the local scene up here in the northeast. And everybody loved him. And he was a security guard as well during the day. And um, he lived for his gym. And during lockdown, um, the gyms closed. And Mark had to work out upstairs in the front room. He, wasn't, he didn't go out a lot because of lockdown. And it affected his mental health, which we did not know about. So uh, I'll start at Father's Day six weeks before the terrible day that it happened. So we had a wonderful Father's Day, and like everything else, my kids, my grandkids were there. It's a wonderful time for me as a father. And I got some great cards, and I, I read the cards, and I did a bit of a speech at the end, and I just said to my kids, look, I really love you guys. And when you read some of the comments on these cards, it says that Mum and I did a really, we did something right in bringing you guys up as children and as human beings. And Mark came over to me and he didn't say, you know, he wasn't a guy for saying a lot, Mark. Uh, he came over to me and he put his arm around me and he looked me in the eye and he said, you know what, Morris, this is, you're the guy I want to be. I want to be like you. And I want to have, I want to, I want my family to be loved the way you love everybody here. And we hoped, we looked each other in the eye and there was tears in our eyes and I, and, uh, he left, and um, I said to my wife, I said to her, Megan, I said, you know, that was so wonderful for Mark to see that, to say that because he's never, ever got emotionally involved with me at that level, and I thought it was a real breakthrough, you know. So between then and uh, the 5th of July, uh, we had a couple of conversations, and on the, 5th of, the 4th of July was Mark's birthday. So <clears throat> uh, Mark, we had a we went across to Mark's house and we had a, a wonderful afternoon. Absolutely spot on. Everybody was there, family. And Mark came in and he, he asked all the family at the end when it was closing down to, you know, just the intimate family. And he took us into the kitchen and he sat us down and, and he, he made one of the most heart-wrenching speeches I've ever heard in terms of who he was, 
what he hadn't done right, but based on, again, the love of the family and uh, how he'd been made feel welcome all the years as our son-in-law. And uh, he felt like my son. And, and there was a few tears, to be perfectly honest with you. And I've got a video of Mark and I playing French bulls. And, and <laughs> he always wanted to beat me when we were doing anything at all. And uh, during the last round of this bulls game, he actually had one bull to go and he was winning. He'd won it, right? But he had to throw one more bull. So he was really cocky and he, and he went down the bottom end and he did an underarm through his legs. And actually it hit his ball out of the way and I won the game. So we had the most unbelievable laugh together. And I remember the last thing he said to me on that Saturday night, you know, uh, he looked at me again. He said, I love you so much, man. He said, I just, I'm just i so glad you're in my life. <laughs> so, so we went to home next morning. Uh, I'm cutting the lawn. It's 10 past 10 in the morning. And my wife, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> My wife rushes out the front door and she says, my God, my God, Mark's killed himself. So I, I just dropped everything. I rushed around. It's only about 200 yards from where I live. We live we're a close family. We live within three miles of everybody. So I rushed around the house and there's Mark. And he had hung himself. And my daughter, <laughs> my daughter, and one of his children I just cut him down. And I saw him, you know, we put him down at the bottom of the stairs. And I prayed over Mark so hard, holding his hand because of my faith, and our, but I knew straight away. I knew straight away that Mark had gone. Mark had taken his life. And the paramedics arrived. The police arrived. The paramedics tried 45 minutes to resuscitate him. I held his hand. I held a drip. And again, I was praying for a miracle. But I knew from the, from the moment I saw him, I knew Mark had left us. Then... During this time of 45 minutes of trying to resuscitate and the, the medics were unbelievable. About 10 minutes into it, I looked at the, the lead medic and I said to him, I said, this is not going to work, is it? And he said, no. I said, I know, he's gone. And I'll never forget. I'll never forget the screaming of my daughter. The noise of her rocking back and forward at the bottom of Mark's feet, screaming. So after we, uh, after they the called the death, uh, um, my daughter came back and hugged Mark, and oh, it was just unbearable. So the ambulance came, they picked him up, and they took him away. And we just sat in the kitchen in total, utter devastation. We couldn't talk, we couldn't speak. We just, it was like, you just couldn't believe it. So we sat there. And then it started to dawn on us that um, the severity of what had actually just happened. The police came and they took his phone away and they took the belt away that he hung himself with. And 
there we were. Four kids in the house upstairs who we hadn't told. Or three of them we told. Well, three we hadn't told. One was there, his daughter was there when we took them down. And we just, you know, it was like, you know, something out of a horror film. So we eventually we left my daughter with um, two of my kids came around, two of my uh, youngest daughters came around. Uh, they sat with her. We took the kids around to our house. And it was just, you can't, you, you cannot, you know, you can write about it, guys. You can write about this how it feels, blah, blah, blah. Hey, no, you can't. Unless you have been in that situation, there is not a chance anyone is going to understand the ripple effect of absolute despair when someone does this. And the questions that you ask yourself, so, you know, it took seven to ten days before, well, it took two months before the body was released because they did a post-mortem and a and uh, because of COVID, we could only have 15, 20 people around the graveside. It was a very intimate burial. I did the eulogy. And it was, it was just, you know, that eulogy was probably some of the greatest words I've ever written. And... Then you go home and you have the wake and you sit there and someone got a photograph of me and I look at it now and I think, you know, if you've ever been in a situation where you've met somebody who's got a thousand yard stare on, lights are on, nobody home. That's where I'm at. Well, that's where I was at. My daughter, it took her six months before she went out of the house. She cried. I've, you know, I know that if it wasn't for my youngest grandson, I, well, I'm not. I don't know. Well, yes, I do. If it wasn't for my youngest grandson, who was eight, she would have followed Mark at some stage. So that's you know, it's we're a year down the line now. Um, the ripple effect is still there. My daughter is, we had to sell the house, so we sold the house. Uh, we couldn't, I mean, I couldn't, I traumatized me, I couldn't go in the house uh, again. I had to, but it used to, I used to, for the three to six, well, three to four months, I woke up with Mark, where I felt, where I, I woke up with that image, and I went to bed with that image. And there was a time when I challenged myself. I said, could you have done anything to prevent this happening? And I was really honest with myself because there was some serious guilt initially. M unbelievable amount of guilt. But I, I've got to the, I, I got to that point about six months when I thought, could I have, did I, did I know? No, I didn't. Could I have done anything? No, because I didn't know. Would it have changed anything? Probably not. Will my life ever be the same again? No chance. Never, ever. So all my wife and I have been trying to do for the last year is to take care of my four grandchildren. My daughter is out there, you take at times you take two steps forward and three steps back. Um, it is one of the things it did with again it it it, it made me realise what a wonderful family that we have because. For six months, not one of my children, not my daughter was never on her own for six months. 
always one of my children would be there overnight with her to the extent where one of them became really quite traumatized by the whole thing. Um, so as a family, you know, one thing I have, I have a real faith and my faith has got me through this. Um, I'm the leader of the family, therefore um, it's my responsibility. But also as leader of the family, you have to be able to share stuff. And it's really difficult to share something like this because unless you've been through this, honestly, no one can say to me, I know how you feel. Forget it, you don't. You've got no idea what it feels like. So by me telling you this and talking about this, if I can save one life, if I can save one person from having to go through what my family has been through, um, it's worthwhile. I will do anything. My whole life's mission now going forward is to work with John and to work with whoever will listen about suicide and what it, what it means and what it feels like. Um, so it's an ongoing thing now. Um, my daughter, my sons have got the, you know, the, the boys live opposite where I am. We rented a house there. Um, my daughter and the youngest son can't live, can't live there because it's too close. So they live uh, about five miles away. It's not ideal, but the two eldest boys, you know, we take care of them and. Um, my daughter is is getting there, but it's really difficult, life changing. Like nobody has any idea what the life changing effect this has. Will we ever recover from recover from it? No chance. Do I want to enlighten people about what happens? Absolutely. I will talk to anybody, anytime, any question. You know, is no, is, any question is not big enough for me to answer. So that's really where we're at now. Um, it's a daily, it's a daily, it's a daily, it's a daily journey. Um, my wife has been unbelievable. My kids have been unbelievable. And the one thing it taught me is that family is the most important thing in your life and also also so there are times someone doesn't want to tell you something it's real difficult to get them to do it because i thought mark and uh, i thought mark told me everything and but he didn't but i stopped blaming myself because you can't could i have prevented it no chance not a chance and I look back and I've challenged myself, I've beat myself up, I've cried, I've all sorts. But my faith has told me there's nothing more you could have done. If someone has got it in the mind at that moment, that second, that second, they will do it. And if anybody wants to know what it feels like, just come and talk to me because books, books in theory don't tell you what reality looks like and what you have to deal with going forward. So that's my story. Um, I'm so proud of my, my wife, my children. Um, I thank God for my faith, which got me through this. And I will, I will move heaven and earth to save one suicide, if I could possibly do that. Morris, that's incredibly powerful and emotional all at the same time. And thank you so much for that. I did have lots of questions for you, but you've answered them all. And I suppose the question I really wanted to ask you was, uh, why would you ever 
want to share that, but you answered that well. And I don't think anybody would probably have to come and talk to you to understand what it's like because you've just portrayed that. And I, I will never say that I would ever understand, but I can I truly believe how unbelievably uh, bad, sad, and emotional. Probably haven't got the words to describe what it's like. And thank you for that. And we'll give you a few minutes there. But Adrian, how do you see that? And, and potentially what could have uh, the difference uh, maybe people's lives would have been for you uh, or for your family? Uh, well, first of all, Morris, that thank you for your, yeah, that very, very touching, emotional um, piece you've just given. Um, you, you said that, you know, could you have done anything? You know, you say you probably couldn't. Uh, for me, I hid every single feeling I had about how I was feeling. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not saying that everyone does that. Maybe some people say, well, I, sh I should have noticed the signs, but to be honest, I hid it really well. You know, lying to my family, lying to my friends, lying to the people I worked with. You know, and even during that really bad stage, I secured the job I'm in now. So I was in a real bad way, but my job took, um, was being managed, but, but I wasn't. But I hid every single feeling I had until it almost came out on that bridge that day. So I don't think that if, if I'd been able to talk to people before and had that um, courage to talk to people, um, yeah, maybe I wouldn't have got to that stage. And uh, maybe that's the same for, uh, for Mark, that maybe he didn't feel he could talk to anybody because he was maybe ashamed or embarrassed like I was. Um, but, but Mark obviously, you know, took his life for the, for the reasons that probably, probably Maurice and the rest of your family will never know the reason why, you know, the, the real reasons why, because I don't know the real reasons why, um, I got to that stage, you know, I, I just wish I hadn't got to that stage. And Adrian, you know, um, where are you now? Um, I know you, you, you've had some success and you know, so I suppose that's the first question. And then to finish, how would you suggest uh, or what would you suggest your coping methods are now? Yeah, so like I said, even during that low stage, I secured probably the best job I've ever had. Um, I work for a global company now. Um, I'm paid very well. I'm recognized globally within the company for what I do. I feel appreciated for what I do. Um, although I am on medication, I am still on antidepressants. And I'm almost worried about coming off antidepressants, if I'm honest. But they are helping, so I continue to take them. Um, uh, so I've got a good job. Um, I now speak to those friends who who I never spoke to before since I got out and probably you'll know John you can really count your really good friends you served with on one on I say on one hand that's what I can I can put, count them on one hand and so I I, I regularly now meet up with you know, a very good friend of mine um you know, every couple of months or sometimes every every two weeks we meet up while I'm while I'm traveling around, I might meet up. Um, uh, and the things I'd, I'd take away from 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 the whole the whole thing is um, when you're getting out. And when you do get out, don't lose sight of who you are and certainly don't lose sight of what you were. You know, you were. Uh, a, a soldier, an airman, a, a sailor, a Royal Marine, you know, what you did for however many years, it doesn't matter whether you got, you've been in for six years, 
you've been in for 22 years, you've been in for 30 years. Um, you know, don't lose sight of who you were and what, what you were. Um, but certainly don't be embarrassed to talk to friends and keep in touch with them and join those groups. Uh, and when you're feeling a little bit low, even in the slightest, give your friends a call. They will listen. And we all think they won't because they all got out. You know, my peer group all got out as officers or weren't officers. Um, but we've all got a heart, really. And we're all going to listen. And we're never going to say somebody, somebody, what, you, you, you're feeling suicidal? You're feeling this? You're not, they're not going to call us weak or anything. That's how I felt. I felt weak and vulnerable. Um, but they're not going to do that. And that's perception you, you've got to get out of your head that that's how people will perceive you. Uh, use the help that's out there. Um, I reckon I think the Forces Transition Group, the help you offer is, is, is immense and amazing to anybody who, who, who has the opportunity has been passed on to, to what you do. Uh, use your network, use your relationships um, to look at the jobs. And I was always told, not always told, when I got out, I, I, was, I met somebody within, within the civilian world who said to me, um, there are three things that will make you happy when you get out of the forces. Uh, and that's your job, your location, and your money. And very rarely will you get all three where you get a good job in an excellent location, earning excellent money. And you might have to jump through a lot of hoops to get those three. Uh, when I got out, I got my job in Afghanistan. So the money was fantastic. You know, I, I was I was earning 140,000 a year. The location was rubbish, but the job was rubbish. I then came back from there. I got a job in London. So the location was OK. Um, the job was OK, but the money was rubbish. And then I got this job I'm in now and the job is fantastic. The location I work from home 90 percent of the time. They fly me around the world when I need to fly me around the world. They fly me business class. They look after me. And, and so the job, the location, the money are great. And very rarely will you get all three. But it may take some time to get to listing all those three uh, where you're then going to be in a happy place. Um, and that's where I'm now. I mean, you know, I'm in a much happier place than what I was. Um, and that's through the support network I've had in these last few years. But those years before, the support probably was there for me but I didn't seek it out. Maybe I didn't want it because I wanted to do it all on my own. And because, because like I said, I felt weak and vulnerable. And I thought I did it as a WO2 when I was serving. I can do it now as me. And I think, I think that's what I want to I like, sort of take away from this. Good advice. Martin, have you got anything to say? Uh, just really good advice. You know, the, the Adrian learned to lean on the support, be it official or non-official with friendship groups and everything else. You know, coming back to that, that cosseted environment that the military gives you, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, just such a, a massive support bubble there. And when you're out of that, you know, you've, you know, as blokes can be very Neanderthal and, you know, we've, we've got to do it on our own. It's, you know, failure is not an option. And, you know, we have to succeed, uh, whatever, at whatever cost. And if we don't, if we don't, understand and this is before you know and this is why ftg force the transition group you know is a fantastic entity because you know there is a support bubble there that will help to replace the forces one but it's 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 a transitional support bubble it's it's of you know a civic street-esque uh nature and there's a lot of people you know on the military side and on the civic street side that can see it from two different angles and that's that's why we talk to an awful lot of forces guys you know because it's it's what does it look like out there um and this this fantastic support bubble um that the force transition group give i think is is something you know to rely on but also friendship groups really really important um i personally didn't didn't really lean on my friends emotionally uh until till my bezzy took his life only about 11 months ago now um, and then we all started getting worried for each other, you know, and now we have a, a WhatsApp group, you know, and weirdly enough, if lockdown's done anything, it's actually uh, t uh, t told us almost, you know, um, taught us to start to rely not just on the, are we having a beer, are we watching the match, or, you know, 
it, we're going a little bit deeper than that. And that's actually quite interesting in terms of a, an evolution of, of just this, this friendship group that, you know, just my personal friendship group. Um, but interestingly, the, you know, Morris is very heartfelt um, uh, account there of something so damaging and destructive. Um, and, you know, Morris talking about it is almost a, a catharsis in, in some way. Um, my partner who, who found my best mate, she's still on the, the massive tranks and still won't talk about it. Um, so that healing process is, is really important, just communicating you know, to the part of it. Um, and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. And I've heard uh, Adrian's story twice now and you get a lump in the throat. And I don't know in terms of uh, yourself, Adrian and, and Morris, does it help? Each time you recount it, not that it'll ever get any better, it, it can't, but does, does something happen in yourself that, that, that feels as a slight catharsis? Um, for me, I'm always nervous about telling people about, about, about this. They know, yeah, you know, I've done it, you know, to a live audience in, in only once now it's a podcast um because no matter how many times i talk about it i i still feel and may and i shouldn't uh, and i've been told i shouldn't i still feel ashamed of where i got to because i keep thinking about what other people are going to perceive their perception of me is um you know, all those years I served, you know, and, you know, and where you were a sergeant major and you had a young lance corporal or signal or a young soldier come in front of you for whatever reason might be. You had the strong shot. You were the, the daddy in the squadron. You were the squadron sergeant major. You know, you, you didn't have any issues. I've no doubt there's plenty of sergeant majors, W02s out there who've got their own issues. But when you step into the office and the working environment in the army, they, those disappear because you are the sergeant major. And... That's what I'm. I still feel ashamed of. That I, what I was in the military, still sits in my head of what I reached, and I shouldn't feel like this. Um, so it it helps because I want. I know that it's going to help somebody out there in the future. Like Morris said, if it's one person or ten people or a hundred people to look at this, but in my mind, it, it, I don't find it easy. It's not getting easier because I. It just it still emphasizes me being ashamed of myself, and I know I shouldn't be, but I can't stop that. And I, I need to stop that, but I can't stop it for some reason. Martin, can you just ask the question again there? Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering whether in, in talking about it and recounting the very painful experience you and your family have been through, I almost know the answer that it doesn't get any easier. It, 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 it can't, I suppose, but you know, the experts tell us that in, in talking and, and re recounting the experience, something cathartic is supposed to happen. Are you, are you experiencing that at all? I think um, for me, it's always been about I don't want anyone else ever to feel like this. I don't want anybody to to go through what we've had to go through, both individually and as a family. And if I can do anything whatsoever to help someone miss out, not, not go down this route, I will move heaven and earth. And John, you know that, but um, does it get any better? Um, it's a day at a time. It's a day at a time because some days, yeah, it's good. Other days, you know, something will happen and, you know, like I'm still working hard with my daughter right now because she is like all over the place still. And um, so I guess, you know, for me, um, I just want to share with anybody who will listen what it feels like in the reality of, you know, after the aftermath of something like this, when you're close to it and you feel it and how do you cope with it? And I can really understand how some people 
just like uh, um, just block it off because it's so traumatic. Um, I think I'm I'm in a position where through my faith I've been able to kind of cope with this uh, in a in a slightly different way. Um, but certainly um, it's life changing, and unless you're there and it's happened to you, you can give all the advice in the world, but you've got to be real and you have to understand it. And I'll do that with anybody. Anybody who wants to talk about it, not a problem. Yeah. Two, two unbelievably strong accounts of, of different sides, I suppose, similar sides as well. And I suppose before we go over to Simon to look at the identity piece as we finish, we will put a lot of things out there so people will have access to, to things after this as well, numbers, that kind of stuff. But I suppose there's going to be people out there feeling like this. Um, and that's okay. That's, it's normal. So please just speak to people. Yeah. Phone your friend. Don't keep quiet. Don't really do what Adrian did. Just open mm -hmm. up, speak to Adrian, speak to me, speak to anybody, Simon, Martin. It doesn't matter who you speak to, just start opening up. And Adrian, I can't thank you enough for that. And also because that's really relatable to our audience, because there will be thousands of people feel like that, believe me. And Morris continues um, to support the Forces Transition Group and, and myself. Um, and we have got things in place, as we said before, and if you're feeling that you need to talk to people, we have got the ability to do that through Morris. And there can't be anything more powerful than that. Now, yeah. Simon, um, Morris, did you want to, to say anything there before we finish? Or go to Simon, sorry? No, I just, I just, um, just want to reiterate what you said, John. Um, I will talk to anybody, anytime, any place um, about about this and about the reality of it because this is real. And you know, in my life, probably the only way I ever learned is through reality. You, you know, you read books to get theory, but life gives you reality, and there's a lot of reality in my heart and in my life. So. Here I am. Use it. Yeah, that's what wise words. But Simon, can you summarise that? I, I'll probably put you in a spot there. Yeah, first and foremost, thank you, Adrian and Morris. Honestly, that that was so courageous um, and heartfelt. So personal thanks. Um, and I just want to pick up on a couple of things that Adrian said. Actually, uh, you were talking about. Um, shame, you know, shame that, that that you were a sergeant major and that happened to you. That happened to, and it shouldn't happen to a sergeant major. And and maybe this does link in to this identity piece because it didn't happen to a sergeant major. It happened to Adrian, and you're human. We're all humans. It doesn't matter what rank or role or job we're doing. Although we hold it close to our heart, we're all human beings. We're not robots. So that brotherly hug that you spoke about, I thought was quite poignant because we need to draw on the brotherhood and the sisterhood as human beings, not as sergeant majors. We, we're humans. And when we're going through this turmoil um, and mental ill health gets to a point where it, it can be quite tragic, at any stage along that journey, we need to, as humans, talk to each other. And I think because that military mindset in that we must succeed and failure is not an option, we we perhaps frame talking as failure, like we haven't succeeded and like a sergeant major should not be talking to somebody um, and putting their hand up when actually it's failure not to talk. And Morris, your heartfelt story is, is you know, it, it just puts that, that into context for anyone watching this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
also to what what I'd like to do now is talk about um, potential strategies to help the military person get through the resettlement journey because there's all sorts of change going on during resettlement journey um, and these changes could lead to overwhelm and, and these types of issues. So a few strategies. Um, the Army Leadership Code talks about a vision, a challenge and a support. I just like to steal that because when you're resettling, you need to have a vision. It is challenging. But the bit that maybe some people lose sight of is there is still support. You didn't succeed through the army to get to where you got to on your own. You succeeded through the support of the army and the system, as well as your, your drive and determination, clearly. And you're not going to succeed in, in Civvy Street without the support. It's just knowing that the support's there and it's finding that support, reaching out perhaps. Um, and the one thing I'm being told consistently is network, network, network. And I suppose that that goes hand in hand with connecting and talking. And whether you're connecting and talking to to broaden your network from a, a professional perspective or whether you're connecting and talking from a human perspective, I don't suppose it really matters. The point is you're not on your own. Uh, so that's that's where I'd like to go with this next bit. Now, when, when you're in resettlement, another useful analogy is a spinning dartboard. And you've got that dartboard and it's spinning. And you need to throw that dart and you need to hit it on the right place. You need to find the right job. You need to resettle in the right way. And it's very difficult. That spinning dartboard is like your mind spinning. Lots of things going on, lots of emotions, lots of priorities, lots of pressures. But it's useful to stop the dartboard before you throw the dart. So in order to stop the dartboard, you have to understand where you want the dart to go, who you are. And this again comes back to the identity. Now in the, in the military, we talk about mission analysis and this mission analysis can be applied to who you are. So first ask yourself the question, what am I? And it, the first answer might be I'm a sergeant major, I'm a, um, you know, a corporal, I'm a, a bricklayer. But that what am I needs to be taken out of the military context and reframed into transferable skills. So when you're asking what am I, you, you kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Adrian, with, OK, how does a WO2 link up with the civilian sector? That bit of it, I suppose, is irrelevant. It's what are my transferable skills? That's the first bit. Um, who am I is really gets into the, the identity. What are your true values and beliefs? And there will be an element of that, that that is military and you need to be proud of it, but leave it behind because the who am I, it, it looks a little bit different as you're starting to look at the door and, and get out there. So you need to really know who you are so that you don't make the, right, the wrong decisions and choices on the direction that you're going. So that going back to the elephant and the ant analogy, you know what, the ele what direction the elephant is going in and you're not trying to walk in the opposite direction as the ant on the elephant's back. Uh, when you're asking who am I, we could probably come up with two, maybe three answers. But if you keep asking that question, who am I? I'm a father. I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a friend. I'm a, I'm a person that likes to be outgoing and meet people and work outside or work with the community. When you keep asking those questions, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Then you will start to, to understand what your values are. And therefore understand what your identity is, your true identity. The next question is why? So why why do you want to follow in a certain go go in a certain direction? Why is it you want to go and be a health and safety manager? Is it because you enjoy doing that type of work, or is it just because that's the qualification you've got from the military and you want to use it because you don't know what else to do? So why is it? What is your why? Now Simon Sinek puts it really well when he talks about 
uh, uh, understand what your why is. So there's a bit that you, that you need to answer. The next one is where. So where is it that you want to be? Because as I said earlier, if you want to be at home with your family because you're fed up with moving around, then you don't want to be going into an industry where there's lots of travel and it's a, it's a mandatory kind of part of that role. It's not going to be congruent with you and your values and your family. The, the final one, and I suppose this is, this is one that is a stepping stone is into the, into the world of networking and the world of the military network, the veteran network. That is how. So once you've established who you are and what you want to do, it's how you're going to do it. And you can't answer that question straight away at the start of your resettlement journey. You have to get out there. You have to network. You have to speak with people. You have to ask the questions and find the answers of how you're going to do it. Um, and I think once you've established all of that, what you've then done during that resettlement journey is you set your reticular activating system. Now, your reticular activating system is the filter that allows information through from the subconscious into the conscious. It's essentially where your focus is at. And as Tony Robbins says, where the focus goes, the energy flows. So if, you're, if you've shifted your mindset into the resettlement space, and that is now your number one priority, you will start having resettlement conversations. You will start getting your reticular activating system, your RAS will start allowing through resettlement information into your conscious mind. You you could be, you take LinkedIn for instance, you could be on LinkedIn, you, you, you'll be on that LinkedIn profile, you'll be understanding what, what's going on out there, you'll be linking up with people, you'll be having conversations, you'll be watching the webinars um obviously trish mullen does a very good one on cv writing um, all of this information is is all out there but unless you set your focus to it you're not going to see it and if you don't see all that information all those answers to your questions you're in a space where you have unanswered questions and that's quite a daunting space to be in especially when part of your identity is, is about to be taken away on your last day of service so just in summary, understand who you are and where you want to go. Be the elephant, not the ant and reach out, whether it's professionally or as a human, reach out and ask the questions. And that hopefully will allay some of that overwhelm. And I just wanted to add something to, to Simon's uh, very wise words um, in terms of that transitioning journey. Uh, we, we mentioned the, the shock of release earlier on, and that's time. Um, so many times, John, you'll know that we, we talk to folks who are, who are coming out in three months, six months. You know, that's almost like, you know, formatting a hard drive on a PC and expecting it to do something for you afterwards. It's not, it's, we're helping people get through those kind of short transition periods, but it is like a massive panic and we are having to move mountains to get them you know, get their CV and, and their, their qual, uh, quals looking, you know, half right. So that they're, they're going out there armed with, you know, a half decent sort of, um, uh, you know, armory, if you like, of, of, of qualifications and able to, you know, take the kind of positions that, that they deserve, really. But, you know, sometimes we get a call from some, from some guys and girls that are three years They've decided their transitioning journey is three years. And it's like, you know, I look to the heavens and think, thank God for that, you know, because to refine identity and go through all those steps that Simon talks about, establishing the how, the why, the what, and everything else, that is, is a, a complete retraining of your, of your own self. And you've got to be fair to yourself and give yourself time. Um, and the more time you give yourself, the, the more time you're giving those that, that sort of help group all those all that you know uh, bubble if you like of, of people that can help you time to help you um you know if you if you're thinking about it and only just start picking the phone up three months before you're getting out you're giving yourself problems um and not just 
you know, practical problems, but you're giving yourself, you know, the more open to those kind of emotional shock of release kind of kind of kind of issues. So. Well, of course, Martin, they've written a JSP on it. It's yes, called JSP one hundred, and we always go back to that. Who's using it? Nobody. No one. Because, and how I get? Yeah, I mean, can I just say, I... Is, we're going to start using it when because nobody's still using it or nobody has started using it because I speak to commanders all the time. They've never heard of it still. Yeah, because it's unwieldy. It, it, it's a problem. I think I think I, I kind of found that I didn't embrace resettlement. Now, although I decided to get out, I still had two years left to go in my personal engagement. I I didn't embrace resettlement because it didn't seem like the military was embracing resettlement. I said, I want to get out. And all I got was from my commanding officer was, why? Why do you want to get out? Well, because I've had enough now. Yeah, but you could do this. You could do that. I want to go on resettlement course. Well, you know, we're a bit busy. We've got this happening, got that happening. And I still focused on what, what, what the military wanted from me, as opposed to what I wanted from getting out and using resettlement to my advantage. So I didn't embrace resettlement because then it meant was, God, I am getting out because I'm on resettlement now. And I, and, I, and I think if you embrace resettlement a bit better, maybe it'll work better for you if you can use it to your advantage. But I, I certainly didn't use it to my advantage. I let the military take advantage of me, should I say. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I believe the review, I believe the review is right. And through service is where it's at. So if we create the ultimate professional, believing that one day they're going to leave, that's how you do it. Because when you give somebody a period at the time and say, right, when you get to the end, we're going to give you this time, that's what they'll wait to do. Because people generally just want to get on with it. They don't want to think about that. But if you do it through service and you make a culture and you make them into the person that one day you will leave, They'll turn up at that end piece already that professional person and they'll understand it way better. And of course, they'll all stay in the military longer because they'll realize it takes time to get to the ultimate professional. And everybody won't be running for the doors like everybody thinks. I guarantee that. But unless people embrace it and allow it into the units, you know, it just it won't happen because JSP 100 is at the commander's door. And the commander moves too quick. The commander goes on operations. He's a busy person, or she's a busy person. So to make them put this in place, then move on, let somebody else pick it up, it's never happening. It needs somebody who is a constant in every barracks, all of the time, two, three times a year, making it and feeding it in the culture. So no matter where the moving parts go, it's irrelevant. It's a constant everywhere. And that's what I want to be. Getting there, not so easy. And I like I like Simon's um, uh, little saying there is you know where the uh, where the focus goes the energy flows. Uh, yeah. you know, at some point, uh, Adrian, you said you know you two years you made a decision I want to get out. You're right, Adrian. At that point, there needs to be a complete refocus. I think Stephen Stephen Covey said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And you, as a transitioner, are the main thing. Yes, you're going to be professional, carry on doing your, your military job and everything else. But the main thing, uh, the focus, the energy, now has to be with you and, uh, and using this huge support network on how to transition. Well and you're, dead, you're dead right, Martin. And, you know, I deal with people every day. Only today, this morning, we've got an elevation program going in, in two weeks' time. I'm saying to, there's been two people this morning, right, we, we'll get you on this one hour session. So we're talking about 60 minutes here, not three weeks, 60 minutes. How, you know, these are guys with less than six months left. One of them less than three months. Right, we'll get you, I can't, I'm too busy. Too busy doing what? <laughs> what are you too busy doing to, to get something that is going to see you out of the military properly? I'm at sea. What, with three months to go? How? How can that possibly be? And I get pressure and all that kind of stuff, but sometimes you've got to put your hand up and say, listen, I can't. I, I've got to look after me. Because you're not going to be knocking on my door saying, there's two and a half grand this month for me wage. 
Yeah. You get one letter, one envelope with a little brown will in it and a piece of paper and all of your skills that you've done. That's it in a badge. Yeah. See you later. No one's there saying, here you go. Oh, no, I tell you what, come back and we'll pay you for three months. <laughs> no chance. So look after yourself. I'm not saying the military need to do anything. I'm saying people need to sort themselves out as well, as, you know, and really realise that the end's coming. It, it, it's going to land on your lap very, very quickly. Now, as we end, I would just like to thank all of our guests. It's been absolutely amazing. Podcast two. Of course, there'll be plenty of podcasts to follow. But I'll just leave you with this. When I joined the forces, one of my greatest attributes was emotion. During my service, I lost my emotion. So as you go into your transitional period, find your emotion. And when you find your emotion and you take that mask off, it will help you become who you are. Thank you. Support is available if you have been affected by anything you have heard in this episode or have found its contents distressing. Talking to other people can be very helpful, whether this is with a family member, friends, a doctor, or a service like Op Courage from the NHS, where you can find help and support organisations around the country. More details for Op Courage can be found in the video description below or by searching Op Courage NHS. Serve well, leave well and flourish. Thanks for watching.